Welcome everyone. Welcome to Heritage Museums and Gardens and welcome to this afternoon's special presentation. My name is Heather Mead. I'm the Chief Program Officer here at Heritage and we're so glad that you could join us today on International Museum Day which has been celebrated globally each year since 1977. Fun fact. In, in the true spirit of the day, we are really pleased to introduce you to an International Museum colleague today. I'm very pleased to welcome Oleksandr Valcha. Oh my gosh, where do I start? Oleksandra is the Deputy Director of the Odessa Fine Arts Museum in Ukraine, is a leader of the non-governmental organization Museum for Change, and is an acting member of the Odessa City Council. At the beginning of Russia's military invasion of Ukraine, she arrived in Massachusetts with her husband and young son, who maybe we'll see at the end. <laughs> and I first met Alexandra a year ago today, actually. I believe it was just about three months after the invasion had begun. And at that time, Alexandra spoke with us about efforts that were being undertaken to protect the art and cultural artifacts of Ukraine. And her presentation really expanded my personal knowledge and all of us who were able to be present of Ukrainian art. And participants told us that they were really interested to learn more. And luckily for us, Alexandra said she'd be happy to help us with that because an important part of the work that she's been doing and involved with over the last year is it has been involved with raising awareness of you about Ukrainian culture. So we're really pleased to have the opportunity to welcome her back today to share a rich introduction to Ukrainian art from historical to contemporary. So please join me in giving her a very warm welcome this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I hope that next year I wouldn't be here because we will win and we'll be back home. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but it's a real pleasure for me to be here again and for my family. As last year it was a breath of normal life and it was my first public speaking in the United States about Ukrainian art and culture. And uh, uh, after that, many museums picked up this leadership model that was shown by Heritage Museums and Gardens, and I've been presenting to multiple places around Massachusetts and beyond. So um, I want to thank Heritage Museums and Gardens, all the team, and for, um, for helping me to find this uh, type of resilience and this type of, um, it's my personal kind of, involvement in the battle. That's the way I participate. Um, so it is very hard to speak about Ukrainian history of Ukrainian culture in one hour. <laughs> uh, but I've already sometimes tried to do it even in 20 minutes. So I will try <laughs> to uh, be brief, but to give you a nice uh, overlook of what we are safeguarding right now during the war in Ukraine. Um, we will, I've divided it in chapters, it's I think nine chapters. We will start with the Kiev and Rus, the period of time between 9th and 12th, uh, uh, roughly 13th uh, centuries. Uh, so this is the mosaics of Demetrius of Thessaloniki, it's 12th century. It was in St. Michael's Cathedral in Kiev. This cathedral was built on the edge of 11th and 12th centuries and it was uh, this is a closer look to the Demetrius, a beautiful mosaic. This is the, the uh, St. Michael's Golden Dome Cathedral, a uh, picture from uh, 1888, and another look of it. And these are the ruins. And it was destroyed by communists in 1933. As some of you might know that um, back then communists were anti-religious, and that uh, many churches of Ukraine became some storage, some warehouses, wherever, some were just blown out, and some were, um, some art from uh, religious buildings was burned, just to have a, tool, uh, a source of heat, 
like just for hitting all of the Baroque sculptures, icons, etc. So we were lucky in this case because before blowing it up, they've sent a team from Moscow to Kiev, and this team specialized in frescoes and mosaics, so they took out some of the, not everything that was there from beginning of 12th century, but some things. And uh, this is the last time when we actually can see, this is, this is the Demetrius, this is another very important uh, fresco. These are the friezes which are very rare and beautiful. So all of this was taken away to Russia. And uh, this is the website of Tretikov Gallery in Moscow. And you can see that this, uh, this particular work is one of the main highlights that such a big institution will put on the front page of their website. And it's uh, uh, after the beginning of invasion, we've thought a, a lot about it, about how Russia is appropriating Ukrainian culture and that it didn't start February 24th or 2014. It actually started pretty long time ago. And this is one of the testimonies of that. Um, and these are also some screenshots with all of the artworks from Ukrainian museums, from Ukrainian history and cultural heritage that Russia is building on to create a myth about their uh, culture. This is the only thing that actually we got to keep from all of that dome, this one here. And it's now in St. Sophia Cathedral in Kiev, which luckily is still standing. Uh, this is how it looks, and it's, it was built in the 11th century. And this is uh, uh, Oranta, Oran. She is like a protector of Kiev. And there is a legend that as long as Oranta is standing there protecting Kiev, Kiev will be uh, protected. Let's see. But from recent news, we know that patriots, uh, the uh, anti uh, missile complexes, are working really, really good. I'm sure that they're somehow working together and they want to use this moment to thank you all and the United States of America for providing that help. A lot of my friends have to experience uh, every night, nearly every night during the last couple of weeks, missile attacks and uh, uh, after receiving the bad roads, I can say, say that they are more sane and uh, calm during those. And this is how it looks over here. This is uh, at the top of the dome. And these are pictures from another cathedral. It's in Russia. And it's just something to compare how this mosaic's uh, history travels through modern culture, in, culture and religion in Russia. This internal kind of look mosaic over here. And all of this, this is the uh, Russian army official cathedral. Yes, they have their official separate cathedral. And uh, over there, you can see all kinds of mosaics with all wars that Russia ever had. And it's an interesting cultural, I don't know how to call it, um, incident, precedent, um, and religious. And there, you can see a lot of details like bullets inside the, the cathedral and the mix of uh, faith and militarization. Uh, so we're recognizing not only culture, but religious too. Then going to chapter two, it's the Kazakh Baroque. The thing is that Kiev and Rus was shortly, like in a couple of centuries, it was divided between different other countries, like Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth, and then uh, there was a um, golden uh, uh, horde that came from east. And uh, eventually, as a state, Kiev and Rus didn't continue, but it became part of all of these different other countries. And for example, for Lithuanian Commonwealth, Ukrainian state of law or other approaches were appropriated and, became, and uh, became a part of that political system. Uh, what we see during this time is that on Ukrainian territory, people more and more time you were more independent and had their property. 
and territories that belong now to Russia, that is now Russia, they did it. And I guess that's the basic of the cultural difference and why they keep doing what they are doing, because they don't understand the value of human's life and human's property. It's been, they didn't experience that for a really long time. So then in, um, in 18th century, uh, Ukrainian state again reappeared on the map and they, they had a hetman. It was a very democratic uh, establishment actually and hetman was very integrated into the life of the country. And uh, under the leadership of a couple of hetmans, uh, Ukrainian culture uh, was received a lot of investment actually. So these are the examples of works of art that you would see in 18th century around uh, Ukraine in Kiev, Chernihiv, in the private houses and in religious houses. And actually, uh, there is a theory, we don't know for sure, that these are two uh, wives of two Ukrainian headmans, and that there was a women leadership very also um, intense at that time. Uh, and even here, you can see that they have not only crosses, but uh, arms too. And this is the Kanastasis. During that time around Ukraine, it's been like, uh, we know records of at least 10,000 Kanastasis of this time. This is one of those. It's Yov Kanzelevich. It's, uh, it was um, uh, produced uh, on the edge of, I have a mistake here, I apologize, of uh, uh, 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, um, he, was, uh, he received his education in the cathedral of uh, uh, the one with the orange that they showed you in the beginning, in Kiev. It's all linked together. And he was an exceptional master. And you can see, you can see these beautiful segments of the iconostasis. This is kind of a Raphaelish work of art, something you would be um, easily you could see in uh, Italy or other places of, uh, um, of the world. Uh, and uh, it was uh, developed, uh, commissioned to a very small little, little town with a very nice church that belonged at that time to the territory of Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then what happened? Then uh, World War I started couple of hundred years after that. Uh, World War I starts and the Russian army of the Russian Empire approached these territories as it was Austro-Hungarian Empire. So uh, officers, uh, Austrian officers, entered the church night before the uh, assault of Russian army. They see this iconostasis and they say, uh, we have to save it, <laughs> we have to do something. And they dismantle it during the night and they take it to Vienna after World War I. Um, and it was also important because it happened to be so that Russian army, when they were approaching, they would burn especially these smaller cities and all of the Catholic cathedrals could be a target easily because Russia was always orthodox. Uh, and see, they saw that as a threat. So it was the first time iconostasis was preserved and saved from them. But then it repeated. Interestingly, uh, when uh, World War I was over and uh, uh, Poland became a sovereign state, uh, Austria became a sovereign state, uh, Poland asked uh, Austrians to return this iconostasis because territory where it was originally from became part of the Polish territory. However, it was the Ukrainian community over there. It's all kind of complicated, I know. <laughs> but I'm really trying, believe me, I'm really trying to make it easier. So it is an important fact that it was reclaimed by Poland and Austrians gave it away right after World War I was over. And then a Ukrainian philanthropist from Lviv who was very into supporting Ukrainian artists, uh, of uh, keeping the history of all of this, especially this period of Kazakh Barov. He bought it from Poland and he had it, but not from Poland, Lviv at that time was part of Poland. From, um, it was in 
not in Warsaw, in other Polish city, I apologize. It's, I think that's better much. So he purchased, purchased the iconostas. He built a separate room in his museum for this iconostas. And 1936, uh, people who lived in Lviv, and especially Ukrainian community and all other communities, had a chance to see the iconostas again. It was so until 1939 when communists and Soviet Union army attacks assaults uh, uh, Lviv, territory of Poland at that time, and occupies the territories. That's when they, knowing that for the past like uh, 20 years, they've been burning everything through, through the religious art in other territories of Ukraine that were already part of the Soviet Union, they figured that they need to dismantle it and to hide it somewhere. So they hid it basically in this other cathedral. It was an Armenian cathedral in uh, Lviv. And it stayed there for uh, until actually independence of Ukraine, 1991. Oh. And finally, after that, in 2000, at the beginning of 2000, uh, it was conservated, because you can imagine the state of this artwork that it was. It was conservated. They spent 10 years doing that. So um, 2014, we are very happy to see this uh, beautiful iconostasis in the exposition of the Lviv National Gallery. And then uh, on March the 4th uh, last year, it, it was again dismantled and sent to some, some place that we call safe, but there is no safe place. This is uh, the story of, uh, that could be, we could say that it is something very typical for Ukrainian works of art. Uh, always in distress, always trying to save it from Russians, and I really hope that it will, uh, it will be over by some time. Um, so, and another interesting thing, sadly, but we had about 10,000 such iconostasis. Now we have four, four, just four. And this one is just one of them. Then, um, Cossack Baroque was over together with the Hetmanat, with the Ukrainian state, because at some point, Hetmanat was always in war either with uh, Moscovia, or with uh, Poland, or with some other mm, countries that were uh, pressuring uh, Ukrainian territory. So at some moment, they made a deal with Moscovia, with the, it was already Russian Empire at that moment. And uh, guess what? <laughs> the deal was broken by Russian Empire. They've killed Headmans, they've uh, nearly destroyed uh, and uh, just exterminated all of the Hitmanite army, all of the Cossacks, it was Cossacks, they were called so. And the, uh, after that, the history of Cossacks uh, was uh, in the uh, folk art. Uh, so, and actually, for folk art, as in any empire, if you look at the history of colonization, any empire would say, okay, we have conquered this territory, these people have beautiful folk art. Look at all of the, um, all of the flowers and the beautiful cute bees that they are making. Look at this uh, and all of this uh, naive art. But they do not have real culture. Real culture is only that's what we have. I guess that replies a little bit why Ukrainian culture was so unknown, but Russian culture was so big for all the world. Because it was a colonizer, it was an empire for a really long time. And it still exists as empire. So this is the Kozak Mamai. And we have a lot of him in Ukrainian uh, folk art. It was like a memory of this Cossack state. And uh, a curious about it that we have here a bottle of wine and a cup, and he's playing some musical instruments, and he's got his horse. And he's always ready to jump on the horse and protect his freedom. And he would always have gone. 
Uh, last year, I showed this work of art from our museum, from the Odessa Fine Arts Museum, this one from Kiev National Museum. And if you could always find it in a different styles a little bit. This one looks more like a painting already. And then it traveled through um, modern art, avant-garde art. This is a Ukrainian artist, David Burluk, which you will find as Russian artist, of course, um, because that's how they do it. But uh, you see he's got a lot of Cossack Mamai in his works of art. Or this is Alva Horska, Ukrainian artist from um, the 60s, her works of Cossack Mamai over here too. And uh, then we go to 1917, uh, when revolution starts at the Russian Empire. And at the same moment, uh, a little bit in a couple of months, Ukrainian uh, state proclaims its independence, as it was part of the Russian Empire, but at a certain moment, uh, they decide to proclaim an independent state. And uh, I always uh, like to remind myself uh, this uh, address to the nation. The 30 million strong Ukrainian people, for the first time, you will have to declare on your own behalf who you are and who you wish to live as a separate nation. As a separate nation. 100 years ago, and this is literally still happening, uh, sometimes you just can't believe it. Unfortunately, the Ukrainian state didn't um, didn't happen at that time. They've been fighting for like three years, back and forth, with communists, with the army of Russian Empire, and with some gangs. So it was a very distressful moment for uh, Ukrainian leaders. And who those leaders were? For example, this is the picture with the Khrushchevsky, who was the president of Ukrainian state. And he is one of the establishers of Ukrainian Academy of Arts. The thing is that when Ukraine was part of Russian Empire, they had to, all the artists, had to go to Moscow or to St. Petersburg to have their education as to become artists, to get a degree. And usually some would stay there because it was an empire. So um, here finally, first thing literally they do after the state is proclaimed, what would you do? Like, you are surrounded by enemies. Your state was just proclaimed. Uh, they established the Ukrainian Academy of Art. And I think that this is a very meaningful example on who those people were, uh, the leaders of that state. And I guess that's why they lost, actually, because they were too, too good, too bright, too humanistic, and etc. They were not warriors, in a way. It's also important. So over here, we have a very important, the most important Ukrainian artist, all around Mikhail Grushevsky. And they established Academy of Art. When the, um, the war is over and uh, Ukraine becomes absorbed by Soviet Union and becomes, becomes part of the Republic, Republic of Soviet Union, uh, communists needed to take all of these intellectuals on board with their project of Soviet Union, communism, etc. So they basically uh, came out to them and said, okay, finally, Ukrainian language is not forbidden. You can write poetry, literature, you can express yourself in any way, theater, movies, whatever. You can do it in Ukrainian language, Finally, after like 200 years of when it's been forbidden, there's been about 36 degrees forbidden usage of Ukrainian language before 1918. So um, Ukrainian artists say, okay, this kind of works. We want to be, we can try and be part of the uh, Soviet Union if we get to preserve our identity, our language, and to um, develop our art. That has happened for like um, 15 years. 15 years, there has been a real blooming in Ukrainian art. Uh, these are works of art by Fedor Krzyzewski from the previous picture. And uh, he was inspired, can you guess, uh, can you guess who he was inspired with? Any ideas? 
Stop sure, sure. That's one of his uh, uh, triptychs: uh, uh, love, life, uh, and uh, he added also a warrior and a warrior who returned from World War One, uh, and a peasant, like uh, speaking about uh, Ukrainian um, experience. We do a lot of trades, a lot of trades that form needs so much. And uh, there's been all of the World War I was on the territory of Ukraine, as World War II. And then, after 15 years, uh, they kind of break the deal. And they literally exterminate all of those artists. There's been, even in Kharkiv, we have a history of the building, which was called a ward building, Budinok Slovo, like literally, ward. And uh, in this, they've built it, it was a constructivist, very interesting. And uh, uh, all of the artists live there, Ukrainian artists, artists, writers, poets, and it was very convenient for KGB. KGB would arrive every night and take like five people at the time. And people who lived there were constantly like waiting. Will it be me today or will it be me tomorrow? And uh, that was one of the darkest uh, moments for Ukrainian art. That's why we call it the extinguished uh, um, renaissance. Because for Ukrainian art it was a renaissance for 15 years. And then it was uh, completely uh, terminated. These are the fragments, for example, of the uh, fresca um, in one of the, from Odessa uh, region, actually. And uh, it was just destroyed in the end of the 30s. And these are some of the examples of the works of art by Ukrainian artists. And if you have in your head an image of Russian avant-garde, just like some things, I think you can immediately notice that this is much warmer, that there is a big difference between what we know as Russian avant-garde and Ukrainian avant-garde, Ukrainian modernism. It's very warm, it's, uh, it's different. And um, I think that uh, right now there is a big ex exhibition in Madrid that is going to Argentina, to Vienna, and then it will move to the Museum of Cologne, etc., etc. I hope that it will, it will get to the United States and that you will get to see it somewhere. So it's really a range of uh, different uh, artists, different techniques, etc. Uh, this is a photo from a couple of years ago, basically, when uh, the thing is that this collection, when uh, Russians started and uh, Soviets, uh, KGB started killing all of these artists, uh, they've also declared that all of the artworks done by these spies, because they were all accused to be spies of all countries of the world at the same time, that all of their works, their artworks, their literature, whatever, has to be destroyed. So first step before you destroy it, you had to collect it from all of the original museums to Kiev. <laughs> so it was collected from all of the museums to the National Museum in Kiev, and they were supposed to destroy it. But 1939, World War II starts, and they are kind of distracted by that. So this collection stays in the end of the storage, very far, and behind the very huge work of art by official Soviet uh, artist. So it was like uh, protecting it in a way, and it was there also basically until Ukraine gained its independence. Finally, a couple of years ago, this collection was shown in Kiev at the National Museum. It became part of the main exhibition of the museum. And now it's traveling around the world. We're very happy that people get to see it after such a long time being hidden from anyone. And I think that this story also highlights what we are going through uh, during the time. This is Joseph Stalin. And this is his portrait from our museum, from the museum collection. It was made by Sad Brodsky. The thing is that uh, to start the extermination project, 
with Ukrainian artists, and actually not only Ukrainian, it was the same with Georgian, with Kazakhish, with Belarusian, whoever had a national identity had to be killed. So uh, he proclaims, uh, with the help of Is Isaac Brodsky, proclaims Stalin's vision of art. So what Soviet Union uh, slash Stalin considers art should be? Art should be very easy to understand, nothing complicated, straightforward, you see, it should, so it should be a realism. Uh, then, uh, it has to speak about very happy, very healthy, very strong uh, Soviet people, and showing this vision that was a fake, and speaking about the mythology of Soviet Union kind of replacing religious paintings and historical paintings, what we could see in academism before that. It was the new mission for all of the artists. Whoever wasn't on board with this was usually would not receive any money for their work or would be eventually killed or sent to Gulag. That's how it starts. And particularly interesting about this work of art and about what is going, what was happening in Soviet Union. This is the original picture. As uh, there's been a great terror, that first they've terrorized people who were um, on board with nationalities and their identities as national identities. Then it was rich people, whoever there was still from the Russian Empire who didn't evacuate. And they've exterminated like millions of people during that time. But then they started, Stalin started to exterminate people from communist circles and communist leaders in the first place. So first he, uh, this, this guy was uh, uh, called a spy and he was executed. And then you could see that this uh, uh, picture was cut. Mm -hmm. Then this guy was prosecuted and executed. So there's been only three of them. Then two, and then eventually, when Brodsky was doing this picture, it was just Stalin. So if you will look at the works of art by official Soviet artists, you would always see that there is more like groups until a certain point, until like 39, there would be groups. And then we have plenty of works of art where they would be, they would repaint something on top of executed our, uh, heroes, uh, protagonists of the uh, painting. So then they figured, no, this is too stressful because we can be killed for having the spy on our artwork. So they started to do just Stalin. Stalin in the field, Stalin in the woods, Stalin looking at the industrialization. <laughs> so it was kind of like this. That was the official Soviet art. This is the Ukrainian artist, Tatyana Yablonska, who is actually, and you will find that a lot in Ukrainian art history, that whom we address as Ukrainians, it's not obligated <coughs> that they are ethnically Ukrainians. They might be Russians, Polish, they might be of different origins. We're speaking about people who identify themselves with Ukraine, with Ukrainian state, with Ukrainian history and culture. It was never about ethnicity. It was about a choice toward future. And this is Tatiana Iblonska. And this is the work of art. Uh, she was actually very close to being executed because her teacher, Fedor Krychevsky, the one that was like claimed inspired by him. He died of uh, hunger uh, in his uh, apartment near Kiev. And she went a couple of times to bring him some food. It was like intentional um, thing. That, like they didn't kill him with bullet, they killed him through uh, hunger. She brought him some food a couple of times and the KGB was kind of after her. And she was always uh, afraid that she would be next. Uh, but in uh, 1949, she finally uh, receives a Stalin, and this is also a bit twisted, like she receives a, uh, an award from, award from Stalin, from the one who actually executed most of her teachers and some of her friends and students she, would, she went to Ukrainian Academy of Art too. And then she receives his award. 
And this uh, here, it's 1949. After World War II, in Soviet Union, there was a great famine. It was a very uh, intense famine. There was no grain for a very long time because of the war, and especially in Ukraine, because all territory of Ukraine was occupied, and only 5% of territory of modern Russia was occupied by Germans for a very brief moment of time. Uh, it was always the territory of Ukraine and Belarus, and this is important to remember also, because Russia is always manipulated with all of the damage that was made by Germans and Rom Romanian armies to, uh, there, to, to them, but it was actually to Ukraine. It wasn't to modern Russia. Yes, it was to Ukraine as a Republic of Soviet Union, but it was not, modern Russia is never close to it. And she makes this uh, artwork, speaking about mythology and lies through the Soviet official art, because at that time, famine, <laughs> no grain. And we see this plentiness, abundance of grain, all of these happy women, they are so happy that they get to work with the shovel, get to load this, uh, uh, this huge, you see, can you imagine how much this weight? And there is not even one man, also because men were killed during the World War II. And they are carrying that around. There is no one who carries those sacks around those uh, bags. And they do it by themselves. And they are very happy about it. They're like, woohoo, we're so happy. We get to do this fabulous work, and that's emancipation in Soviet Union, and we're so happy. Yeah, uh, go, go girls. And, uh, and then, in a couple of years, like 20, when Stalin is already dead, long ago, she starts a different series of work. And this is nowhere close to the realism. This is not the um, socialistic realism. This is something else. And you can see here pieces of Ukrainian tapestry, Ukrainian embroidery. Actually, today is the Vishvanka Day. Uh, the, this is the national uh, Ukrainian uh, shirt. And, uh, and this is called Visiting the Grandson. And uh, you can see this woman, you can see that her hands are a little bit larger than her face. You, it, it feels like this. She is definitely making us look at the hands, and her hands look just uh, terrible, they're worn off. Uh, they're like a tree, uh, like a, in, a, in a way. But when you look at her face, maybe it's just me. But uh, I think that her eyes are not that old. That through her eyes you can see she, that she is not that old as we could think about it. That she is just worn off by this beautiful, fabulous labor <laughs> that women were happy to, to do in Soviet Union. And that was a statement also by Yablonska. It was something like uh, redemption, I don't know, maybe. Uh, for receiving that award, for the work of art, that was a lie. And then, uh, in the end of 60s, they start uh, a new movement uh, starts to work in Ukraine. It's called the non-confirmism. Like, they were not uh, on board with official Soviet ideology, and they couldn't do it officially, so they were producing some art for official, uh, exhibitions, official orders, and then something was done private with houses and they would do a lot of um, exhibitions in apartments. And uh, the, only, the only part where they could express themselves more freely was in monumental art, mosaics, and from that time we have beautiful mosaics by great Ukrainian artists like uh, this one over here. It's in occupied uh, Lugansk Oblast, and this is Ava Korska. And she's also a, a ethnically Russian, same as Yablonska, but she considers herself Ukrainian. She was speaking Ukrainian. She learned it as an adult, and she was very eager to speak uh, this language. This is her with the baby and with her husband. 
also uh, important Ukrainian artist, Deretsky. And another thing that she does, she is constantly speaking out. She is speaking out when Stus is arrested. That was the last Ukrainian poet that was uh, killed in the Gulag, uh, kind of in the concentration camp. And she speaks about the mass murdering site, the site where Ukrainian artists were um, buried uh, near Kiev. And she was the first one to speak publicly and loudly about it. And uh, these are also some works by her in Mariupol. And it's completely lost with it by now. This was during the Shevink in the first month of war. And uh, then, um, under the circumstances that we still don't know for sure, uh, she was killed together with her father-in-law in her apartment. But uh, we're pretty sure that it was KGB because she was uh, surveyed by them. And uh, it was after she was speaking again publicly about all of the mass murders, about all of this. And uh, this is the mystery. We hope we will find the knowledge will be there someday. And then going to art of 2000s, uh, I think this is Alexander Roydward from the Odessa Fine Arts Museum collection. And uh, he, uh, he became artist in uh, end of 80s. And this is the work of art he donated to the Odessa Fine Arts Museum. This is the museum exposition uh, 2018. And that's uh, the room where we have Kandinsky, Serebrikova, many pretty famous artists, Goncharova, for example. And it's every rain, it would look like this. So he joined the museum as director. I joined the museum as his deputy. And we started to build community around the museum. Something that I was inspired by visiting the United States constantly, seeing that around American museums and the way they are loved and cherished and taken care of by communities. So we started to do that, and uh, the museum, this is Alexander Roydward, and the new kind of team of the museum, the project team. And uh, um, very soon, the museum became, you could hear that everything in the museum was in Ukrainian language. We would do an exhibition about this special fund that was forbidden and hidden in the National <coughs> Museum for such a long time. We spoke about that, we spoke about repressions. Immediately, uh, the party of Open Block uh, in Odessa, they were pretty strong. They had like 30% in every council uh, around Ukraine, uh, around uh, Eastern part. And they were controlled by Russia because head of that party was a cousin of Putin and he was exchanged uh, for 200 defenders of Azovstal in, I believe, uh, somewhere in May last year. They've exchanged, we, we returned 200 people for giving him out to Russia. So this pro-Russian <coughs> obviously party they, they are standing for conservative values and Russian language and Orthodox Church and things like that. Uh, they tried to fire Alexander Roydward and to get rid of our team. It was a threat for them that culture becomes Ukrainian <laughs> in Odessa. They were against that. They were trying to get rid of us. And they were stating that Alexander Roitbert was copying works from the collection and selling the originals and leaving the copies in the collection. So he did this series of copies over here. It's not quite so similar. You can see a little bit difference in there. But he tried really hard. And he actually did sold all of those copies. And uh, he's doing this in the Malevich style. Also, returning to the discussion about either Malevich was Ukrainian or Russian, uh, we think that we have pretty strong uh, testimonies that he considered him a Ukrainian. He spoke Ukrainian, he uh, wrote a lot about Ukraine and the, all of the, um, his experiences, first the drawing lessons, etc. This is all from the Odessa Fine Arts Collection, and then eventually he decided to go above 
Ukrainian museums and go to Caravaggio, to the head of uh, Galeab. And uh, it was always uh, from February 24, this uh, work of art has more meaning for us. Like in that story, uh, David managed to defeat Galeab, who was indefeatable, who was maybe second Goliath in the world at that time. And uh, we hope that that's what is going to happen soon too. And this is the Odessa Fine Arts Museum on February 24th, with uh, that work of art wrapped somewhere in there. And the final work is uh, yeah, a little bit about work of uh, art. Uh, a lot of uh, fast sketches became uh, widespread in Ukraine by Ukrainian artists. Uh, they would uh, speak uh, a lot uh, about that. This is uh, Katerina Lysolenka. Um, and uh, over here, she's a little bit speaking about how we feel sometimes when um, the world is watching what is happening in Ukraine and like uh, deciding, are we there yet to give something more for them to defend, to regain their territory, or do we need the, the more killings or something? Like being standing aside and just looking at whatever is happening. And over here, for a Kinder album, this is your kind of, um, it's again a Ranta, but in, not in this way, in a different way. She is trying to protect people in the sharing during the first months of war. And then this is January of this year, Alexina Kahidze. I really like this little sketch of yours. She does one every day, and now it's 448 days of war today. So she says, I'm still alive in Ukraine, but it is only an accident. Uh, and that's how Ukrainian artists sometimes feel. They have a choice of being somewhere in residence, somewhere around the world. Or they can stay in Ukraine and go through this experience with their people, with their country. And it is um, my pleasure to say that we have an NGO in Ukraine that managed to purchase Ukrainian art of war for 300,000 euro during this year. And it was all fundraising through Ukrainian business, Ukrainian donors, and people who were very much interested to preserve this art, to make sure that that's how we will be telling the story of this war when it's over in 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years from now. And uh, this is it. Um, I actually, not to finish it on a sad uh, note, I will take two more minutes to speak about, uh, about something else for Ukrainian collections. Um, so, uh, when the war began, uh, one of the Ukrainian museums in Kramatorsk was very close to the battle line. And the director of the museum, she had to destroy part of her collection because it was about local activists of Maidan Revolution of 2004, of the beginning of the war of 2004, and to protect families of people whom they would speak about, they had to destroy all of the evidence, not to make it a kill list, basically, for Russian troops when they will enter the city. So she was burning everything, burning, 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 and then final last convoy of militaries picked her up, and she evacuated the city with them. And while they were going through the uh, just road with fields on the sides, they saw a paratrooper going down. And the uh, <coughs> convoy stopped, uh, army, men, <laughs> soldiers, they went there, they took him into the custody, and they were accompanying him to the vehicles. But then she gets out of the car, she runs into the field, and everybody, the soldiers try to stop her, they do not understand what is happening. She picks up the parachute and she says, I just realized that this is the number one object of the new collection of my museum. And this parachute will help me speak about this war through the museum's collection. 
And after, during this war, many of my colleagues go to the occupied territory to collect new objects, new collections for Ukrainian museums to speak this story. And that is also something that I'm so deeply inspired with. Uh, so it's very hard, but we have a vision of future. And uh, we really hope that victory will happen soon and we will see you all in Ukraine in all of the Ukrainian museums. Thank you very much. And we will be very grateful for any support that you can provide to uh, Odessa Fine Arts Museum on the International Museum Day. I would be very happy to reply your questions, if there are. It can be any, by the way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexandra. Any questions for Alexandra? Thank you so much. Any questions from anyone? Please do feel free to visit with Alexander. Also, oh yes, please. Um, how did you get out of Ukraine? Uh, it was on the uh, first day of the invasion, and uh, Odessa is located geographically near Moldova, so we went there by car. But we had to leave the car and had to walk. It was. It was not as tough as for many, many Ukrainians who would do it a couple of days later. People would spend uh, 30, 50 hours, uh, 60 hours on border just to cross it. Oh, okay. it was but many, many have returned. Right now, as I know, uh, about uh, 8 million people left Ukraine in the beginning. And now it's more like 4.5 million. Yes, but we are very hoping that all of them would return, and uh, most of them would return uh, to Ukraine after the victory. And I also wanted to add that it's very nice to see uh, some faces that I've seen already last year. <laughs> it is a thank you for revisiting. It's very pleasant to see. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please feel free to approach and to ask something I'm here. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Alexandra for being here today to share your expertise with us. And thank you to all of you for joining us today.